teaching text will be from the book of Luke. I'm reading from chapters 11. And this is how it reads. He also said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food, and here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up, go to my father, and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father, but while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father took his, but the father told his servants, Quick! Bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field as he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, look, I have been slaving many years for you, and I have never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours come, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Son, he said to him, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, church. My name is Lesejo and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ through Fellowship City as an elder and uh, this morning to preach the word of God to you. This morning we spend time on God as Father. Why is this important? Why is it important that we understand the identity of God as Father? This is because we are created or exist to worship God as He is and not as we want Him to be. So we ought to enjoy God for who He is. You can't enjoy something or someone you don't know. If you don't understand God as Father, then you don't really know who He is. So it is important to know who God is, especially as God the Father, in order to worship Him. Throughout the Bible, there are expressions of the character of God, and we can see God as Father. This morning, we spent some time looking at Luke 15, verse 11 to 32. This is the parable that, that Jesus teaches that Tandiwe read for us this morning. 
Luke 15 as a chapter helps us understand why Jesus teaches this parable and also the audience who should hear this parable and the audience that is hearing this parable. As we engage this parable this morning, we will see three main characters. We will see a younger brother, an older brother, and we will see a father. The younger and older brother seem different at first, but they they ultimately have a similar underlying problem. They are both far from the father. Both don't actually know the father, and that influences how they live and the choices that they make. The choices they make show what's in their heart. As we understand the choices they make, we will see the response of the father to the choices that the younger and older brother make. I know that as we sit here this morning, we have different experiences or expressions of father or fatherhood, but please don't check out because we will see Jesus depict the character and nature of God the Father. We will also understand the role Jesus has and as he narrates this parable to the audience before him and the role that he has as we read and consume this parable. Let me pray for us as we get into God's word. Let's pray, church. Lord, we thank you that this morning we have an opportunity to gather as your people, an opportunity to sing songs of praise and worship to you, to reflect how great you are, and to honor and glorify your name. We pray that as moment, as we sit quietly and hear you speak to us, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be here, Holy Spirit would speak, the Holy Spirit would be active, the Holy Spirit and your word would continue to conform and change us to the likeness of Christ. I pray against any distractions this morning, I pray against all the things that we have planned, or the things that are coming up this week, I pray that you would quieten those and remove them from our minds. Help us to focus on you. Help us to hear what you have to say to us this morning. Speak through my vocal cords. Let your word be true to all our hearts. And let us be conformed and changed by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We have four points this morning. So we're going to look at an overview of Luke 15. I think it's important to understand the whole letter as we understand the focal point of Luke 15, 11 to 32. So we'll do the overview of Luke. We'll look at the younger brother and the older brother. I don't want to say verse um, because we saw the Springboks win. So let's leave verse out there. So the younger brother and older brother. And then we'll see how those are contrasted uh, together. We'll see God as Father. That's our third point this morning. And then we'll ultimately look at our response. So what is our response to God as Father? And what is our response to the younger and older brother? Before we look at the overview of Luke 15, it is important to take one quick side road. As a church, we believe in the triune God or we believe in the Trinity. We believe that the Trinity is three persons who are fully God with individual roles or attributes. We believe that understanding the Trinity is key to understanding who we are and to understanding the gospel. We see the idea of the Trinity from the beginning of the Bible, and we see this in Genesis 1, verses 1 to 3. Genesis 1, verse 1 to 3 reads as follows. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. So we see that God created the heavens and earth in verse 1. In verse 2, we see that the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface. And in verse 3, we see God speaking light into existence. And throughout the Bible, especially in John 1 and 2 Corinthians 4 verse 5, we know light to be the Son of God. Let's continue to Genesis 1, verses 16, which is the sixth day of the creation account. God says, let us make man in our image. This phrasing, let us, again shows the idea of the Trinity, and it shows the relationship or the community that exists within the Trinity. We just read two scriptures or two references from the Old Testament, specifically the first book of the Bible that show the Trinity, or expression of the Trinity. The the New Testament also has the idea of a triune God or the Trinity. In Matthew 3, verse 16 to 17, we see the baptism of Jesus. And then from verse 16, the Bible says, when Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water. 
the heavens suddenly opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descend like a dove coming down on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So we see instances or ideas about the Trinity in the Bible. We see this both in the Old and the New Testament. In the Bible, we see God the Father. We see this specifically in Matthew 3 in Genesis. We see God the Son in a few references as well. And we see God the Holy Spirit. I don't want to spend too much time on the Trinity this morning, but I think it's important to understand the Trinity before we focus on God as Father. So the, the Trinity is three persons in one. They are all God, but have different functions. The Father sends the Son to die for us, to redeem us, because we can't do anything in and of ourselves to make us right with God the Father. The Son fulfills Scripture, obeys God, and lovingly pays for our sin and redeems our separation from God in dying for us on the cross. The Son is fully God, and that is why the payment of His death was enough and is enough, because He is the ultimate perfect sacrifice for our sins. The Holy Spirit constantly points us to the cross of Christ as the Reformation is continuing in our hearts. The Holy Spirit is our counselor, our comfort, and the Holy Spirit dwells in us and conforms us to the likeness of Christ. So in the Trinity, we see the expression of grace, we see unity in the Trinity, and we see the glory of God. If we don't understand the Trinity, then it will be hard for us to understand who we are and how we ought to respond to the gospel. So this morning, we'll only focus on God the Father, because there's importance in understanding and knowing God as Father. Luke 15, verse 30, uh, 11 to 32 is a very well-known parable. Uh, many people know this as a parable of the prodigal son. This parable sits among a few other parables within Luke 15. And the intention of this parable and other parables within Luke 15 is to teach about the worth of a lost soul. With all the parables in Luke 15, we see the joy of God welcoming the lost who are now found in his family. In verse 1 of Luke 15, we see the scribes and the Pharisees complain about Jesus welcoming and spending time with tax collectors and sinners. Verse 1 says, all the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him, and the Pharisees and scribes were complaining, this man welcomes and eats with them. So in context, the tax collectors were Jews. They were people known to be part of God's chosen people because they, they were Jews, but they were working for Rome. So you can think of it like people taking money from their own people for the good of people who are against that group of people. So sinners, as mentioned by the Pharisees and scribes in Luke 15, are those who lived in disobedience to the commands of God. These people mostly included those who were living in sexual sin. So Jesus eats with people who are seen as betrayers of their kind and people who are seen as sexually immoral. This is how the Pharisees would describe and picture these groups of people. This is what the Pharisees and scribes are complaining about. Jesus then uses parables to speak to why he's sitting with tax collectors and sinners, as to why he is here. Jesus came to rescue those who need a doctor, those who are lost, the marginalized. Jesus, in the context of Luke and what has happened before it, teaching about following himself, about humanity, about being charitable, charitable heals many. The eating as mentioned here in Luke 15 verse 1 is because Jesus hosted or created many banquets where he would invite the marginalized and lost. So the first parable in Luke 15 verses 1 to 7, Jesus teaches about the lost sheep. The essence of the parable is the worth of the one lost sheep. Shepherd, in this sense, leaves all the other sheep, leaves the 99 sheep to go after the one sheep and rejoices once the lost sheep is found. The second parable is Luke 15, verse 8 to 10. The parable is about the lost coin. Here we, f we find a woman who's lost one of her 10 coins and they start looking everywhere for that lost coin, basically searching until she finds it. Again, upon finding the coin, the woman rejoices. So in both these parables 
of the lost sheep and the lost coin, we see great joy over one found item or found, found person, and we understand it as one lost person being found or a repentant person being found. Luke 15, verse 7, the first parable ends off by saying, I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. And Luke 15, verse 10, the end of the second parable says, I tell you in the same way, there's joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. So even though the context is speaking about a lost sheep and a lost coin, this is referring or speaking about someone who's repentant and now found within the kingdom of God or within God's people. So let's focus in on on Luke 15 for a moment. So Luke 15 verses 11 to 32 is the third parable, and it's the climax of Luke 15. It is titled The The Prodigal Son, and this parable could be renamed to the father and two sons because it is not only about the returning repentant son, but also about the older grumbling son and also about the loving father to both sons. So the prodigal son is identified to be lost, like the coin and sheep. However, we will see that the older brother is also lost and far from the father in his heart and in his soul. So Luke 15 verse 11 starts as, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to the distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. So the younger son asks for his share of the estate. Under normal circumstances, he would have only received his share of the estate when the father passes on or when the father dies. So he then wishes the father to be dead so that he can receive all that he can from the father. So he doesn't want the father but wants the things that the father can give or do for him. Luke 15, uh, verse 25 to 30. Now his older son was in the field. As he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him, but he replied to his father, look, I've been slaving many years for you, and I have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. So the older son became angry at the returning of the younger brother, became angry that a fattened calf was slaughtered to celebrate his return. So remembering the lost coin and sheep, when there is rejoicing at a lost item being found, the older brother is not rejoicing. The older brother sees himself as someone who's slaved away, someone who stayed with the father, stayed by the father's side. He is angry and self righteous. These are his words because he, sla- he says he slaved away. He replied in verse 29 to his father, Look, I've been slaving many years for you and I've never disobeyed your orders. So we have two sons, both who don't want the father but want the father's things or want what the father can do for them. Both sons are therefore far from the father. They don't know or really have a relationship with the father. Let's be honest, fam. As we look at the younger brother and older brother, And now we're moving into our second point this morning. There are two groups of people sitting here this morning, or if you're listening on YouTube or the audio podcast, the younger son represents the tax collectors or sinners in the context of Luke 15 because he is similar to those who have sinned against or don't want the Father. He's a representative of people who disobey God, who choose to live their best life now without restraint. The heart of the younger son was one of foolish ambition to be independent. He travels to a distant country, 
lives foolishly, lives for the moment, he loses everything. Think of Iron Man from Marvel, Tony Stark. He, he, inherits, he inherits his father's wealth, intellect, and legacy. He disappears and lives for the moment, squandering his wealth. Lives a frivolous lifestyle, meaning carefree, no purpose. He loses everything, including some of his beliefs. He returns home after having lost everything. And people thought he was dead. So modern day examples are people who live without regard for God. You see God in everything. You see God in nature, in other people, but you choose to live like God doesn't exist. Rebellion sometimes sounds and feels like fun. Think of the bro- younger brother asking for all the inheritance, thinking of how the world is now his oyster. Thinking of YOLO, you only live once now in his head as he receives this inheritance. Think of someone who drinks regularly, maybe even to avoid the problems. The alcohol feels and sounds fun, but then you develop alcoholism. And maybe you avoid the signs of needing help, and you squander your future because of the hold that substance abuse can bring. Think of someone who struggles with their finances, starts living their life for the moment, spending money. They become Moreki, and Moreki is someone who's a buyer of things and fills the table with things. So they lose all their wealth and struggle to make ends meet. Think of someone who watches porn or unhelpful images, starts by bringing or feeling emotions of satisfaction, but ends with brokenness and not understanding of people as the image of God. These are examples of people enjoying their lives now, living without purpose and ultimately living like the younger brother, squandering their future, spiraling out of control. The older brother represents the Pharisees and the scribes in Luke 15. Like the younger brother thinks he has done right by the father, the the older brother thinks he's done right by the father. The relationship the older brother has with the father is one of works. He points out that he has been hard at work, that he's been slaving away, that he has been there. He points out that he has been hard at work. The older brother was so caught up in his self-righteousness that he forgot why he was actually living. There's a movie titled Dead Man Walking. It is a true story about a death row inmate, basically someone who's waiting to be executed for the crimes that they committed. This inmate's name is Matthew, finds a spiritual advisor in in a nun who helps him find forgiveness. The nun advocates to have the sentence reduced, but the brother of the nun is like the elder brother because the brother of the nun who believes that Matthew should die for his actions The brother of the nun represents that elder brother because he resents the mercy that he's seeing develop as the nun, which is the sister, is helping Matthew. Matthew in this picture is somewhat like the younger brother who squandered his life, disobeyed the law. Both the brother of the nun and the elder brother struggle with feelings of anger and resentment towards those they feel have done wrong. And both struggle to extend forgiveness and grace to those who have sinned. If we work to try and get the approval of God, what it says is that we don't actually know God as Father. We serve out of, we should serve out of the abundance of our heart because of what Jesus has done on the cross for us. So we serve God as obedience to Him, but we're not primarily servants. We are primarily sons and daughters of God because of what Jesus has done on the cross for us. And we serve out of what Jesus has done on the cross for us, not to not to pay for our own sins, which Jesus ultimately pays for. In the parable of the prodigal son, both sons are far from their father. They don't want the father. Now let's focus on the father and his response to both the younger and older brother. Luke 15 verse 18 starts off by saying, I'll get up. Go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against him, heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. This is the younger brother. Make me like one of your hired workers. 
So he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. And let's celebrate with a feast. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. The father sees the son while he's still far off. While still a long way off. The father's filled with compassion and runs to the son. Firstly, the first part shows that the father was waiting or looking for the son. And that is why he saw him from far away. He was hoping that the son would come back and the son would be found. Secondly, Jewish men in this context in this day would wear big robes. This was also part of a sign of wealth. This robe would not make running easy. Along with the fact that running would not be seen as something that men would be doing. So you can imagine and think of this father who now sees the son coming. Son who wanted him dead. This is the same son that wanted all that he could from the father and not the father. This is the same son that abandoned the father. And you can picture the father lifting his robe a little bit so he can run towards the son to embrace the son. You can see the son starting to try and work his way back in. Starts saying words that he had prepared before in his mind. Because he wants to be like one of the servants and work for the father to attain the love of the father. But the father doesn't let him finish. Because the father just wants to honor the son because the son has returned. So the son was positioning himself as one who would work for the father's love, as one of the servants. But the father doesn't see him as a slave. The father sees him as a son and doesn't wait for him to finish his train of thought. He doesn't listen. He embraces the son and asks for the best robe, for a ring and sandals. You can imagine that this son towards the end when he's planning to come back home, he was sleeping with the pigs. He was dirty. He had come to the father to be like one of the slaves, but the father brings the best robe, calls for a ring. In those days, a ring would, would, would signal that you form part of a specific family, asks for sandals. Sandals were not worn by slaves. He's honoring the son as the son comes back. The father throws a celebration. So remember the one sheep or the, the sheep that was now found. Remember the lost coin. The father throws a celebration. The father rejoices for the son. Rejoices that the son has come back. This is the love of the father instead of punishment for the actions of the son. Psalm 103, verse 10 to 13 reads as follows. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As the father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. I want you to consider the context of this parable, church. The Pharisees and the scribes were complaining about Jesus sitting with the tax collectors and sinners in verse 1 of chapter 15. Listening to the worth of the lost sheep that the 99 is left to find the one and listening to the worth of the one coin with the house turned upside down and then listening to the son who forsakes his father but is loved, is welcomed back, is honored, is given sun rights again 
by the Father. The tax collectors and sinners are hearing that God the Father loves and finds worth in the lost. This parable as they're sitting there listening to Jesus would have been great news for the tax collectors and sinners. They would have been sitting at the edge of every word. This would be good news for them. And this would be good news for us, fam, if we don't know God as Father. His love is so radical. Listening to the parable also are the complaining Pharisees and scribes. And you can imagine the complaining and grumbling growing louder and maybe at how unfair they find the treatment of the younger son. In context, they would have expected the younger son to be stoned. So Deuteronomy 21 speaks about a rebellious son who dishonors and wishes death on the parents is to be stoned to spare the parents. So they might have expected a stoning at the return of the son, but rather are met with his redemption. One would think that as the son as the son is coming towards the father and the father's approaching the son, that he would hug him and embrace him and put his hands around him to protect him from being stoned. Because the culture would have said that someone who disowned the father, that's the punishment they would receive. But you can imagine the Pharisees as they listen to this would have expected that, but they're seeing redemption. Let's see how the father responds to the older son and in turn how he responds to the Pharisees and the scribes. Luke 15, verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told them, and your father slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him, but he replied to his father, Look, I have been slaving many years for you, and I have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Son, he said to him, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Everyone is rejoicing that the son has returned. He's dressed in the best robe. He's wearing sandals and he's got his ring on, which signifies him belonging back to the family. There's music and there's dancing. There's a feast. There's a fattened calf, probably similar to like Wagyu beef of the day with high fat content. Um, so there's this fattened calf that's being enjoyed. I'm sure the fattened calf slaps and tastes as we get this picture of music and dancing within this context. What is striking at first is that the older brother summons one of the servants. He has direct access to the father. He chooses to go to the servants. He has direct access to the father, but goes through the servant of the father to speak to the father. The father doesn't wait for him. The father doesn't stand his ground. The father goes outside and pleads with him. The father pursues him. That is astonishing to me because I know if I was the older brother and outside my dad would have just said my name and I would have heard the tone in his voice and I might have walked in with my head bowed. But the father actually pleads with the older brother, goes outside, meets him where he is. And let's hear the words that he uses, which I think are so good. He says, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. The father is saying, you don't have to work for my approval or for my love. The father is saying, you are always with me. You and I are one and everything I have is yours. He also reminds him about the reality and identity of his brother. This brother of yours was dead and is alive again. We have found your brother. Come and rejoice with us. He is alive. Let us rejoice, son. Everything I have is yours. This means that the older son could have also had his party any time he wanted. Everything was yours. But his eyes and heart were in the wrong place. Fam, they were in the wrong place because he was working for the wrong reasons. 
I think the older brother is also portraying the father as stingy, but that's not what we see. He was a slave in his father's house. He was a slave and acted like a slave in his father's house. Fam, we should stop being slaves in our father's house. Here's what a slave in the father's house does. You can picture a, a table, a long table, uh, a dinner table if you to call it that, all kitted out. Here's what a slave in the father's house does. Complains when the father blesses others and doesn't ask the father for themselves. If we were sitting around this table, the slaves would eat the crumbs of the edge of the table as if there isn't a fattened calf on the table. A slave would sit on the edge of the table maybe as if there isn't space or maybe away from the table as if there isn't space. But as a son in the father's house, the older brother had a seat at the table. He could have had his party. He could have had a goat or a calf, but his eyes were at the wrong thing. He was working towards the approval of the father. As a son in the father's house, the older brother has a seat at the table. Everything the father has is his also. Sometimes, fam, we, we are like slaves in the father's house. We live like we don't understand our identity as sons and daughters. We don't ask, we don't come to God, but we grumble like the Pharisees and scribes when others are blessed. We already have the robe, fam. We have the, the best robe. We have the ring, we have sandals if we have put and placed our trust in Christ. We are adopted, we are loved if we have come back to the Father. We can ask boldly of the Father and he will not withhold anything from us. Galatians 4 verse 6 to 7 says, Because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Let's look at the role of Jesus in, in, this, in, this, in this letter. It is of one who came to save the lost. Jesus preached and performed miracles. Jesus came to save those who were lost, those who were far away from God because of sin, which separates us from a holy God. God as Father makes a way in his love to save the lost by sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross for you and for me. It seems Jesus came for the younger brother who was far from God, who didn't have a relationship with God. But in truth, fam, he also came for those who don't see and comprehend how far they really are from God, like the older brother, like the Pharisees, like the scribes, who are self-righteous, who believe they are saved by works. Jesus in the parable exposes the heart of the younger brother first, the tax collector and sinner, because they're all similar and represent the same thing. He exposes the heart of the young brother, that they're disobedient, want to live lives without God. They sin and are separate and, and separate themselves from God. But Jesus also shares the good news that they have redemption in the Father and the Father rejoices as they return. They have the grace from the Father regardless of what they have done. Jesus exposes the heart of the older brother, the Pharisees and scribes, and that they can't work their way to a relationship with God. Grace doesn't come because of the good deeds. St. Augustine says, For grace is given not because we have done good works, but in order that we may be able to do good works. So grace does not come because of how obedient they have been. It is only because of God. It comes from God alone and his mercy. Jesus exposes that they have worked as slaves in the Father's house because they have wanted to work to attain the love of the Father, even though they have the love of the Father freely because of who the Father is. Jesus shows the heart of the father. The young brother, tax collector, the sinner, the older brother, Pharisees and scribes are far from God, but they have, but have the rebellion and sin covered by the heart of the father. So the heart of the father covers that sin and rebellion and brings them near to God. Jesus shows the heart of God as father to be one of great compassion, one of great mercy and great kindness, one of great love. We know, that to be, to redeem, we know that because he redeemed us through the death of Christ on the cross for us. Fam, as we close this morning, if you identify as a younger brother, as someone who doesn't know the love of the Father, 
Maybe you have heard of God as provider or healer. Maybe you have heard of God as creator of the universe, but you should know God as father and redeemer. If you have not put your faith in Jesus and his finished work of the cross, you should know that God is father. If you don't know the father as compassionate, as father, as redeemer, then maybe this is a moment to know him. He wants to have a relationship with you. If you identify as an older brother, if you've been working hard to find your identity in God, then fam, hear this parable. Works don't get you sonship. They don't get you the inheritance. Only God as father and redeemer. For both the younger brother and the older brother should know your identity. You are sons of the most high God and not slaves. You are loved more than you can ever imagine. You need to live out of this truth. You have direct access to God as Father. You have family. And there's rejoicing as this family grows. Here's a quote from John Piper. If you don't feel strong desires for the manifestation of the glory of God, it is not because you have drunk deeply and are satisfied. It is because you have nibbled so long at the table of your world, of the world. Your soul is stuffed with small things and there's no room for the great. This quote means we need to check our hearts that we're not full or satisfied by the things of the world. We must not be satisfied at nibbling at the table of the world when we are sons of God the Father. We should desire to see the manifestation of God and the glory of God. We should desire to see his return because we will reign with him when he returns. We will ultimately enjoy the inheritance in heaven as sons. We should dig, drink deeply from his word, fam. We should be transformed by it. We should live our identity as sons of God the Father. We should worship God as Father. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the cross. Thank you that through the death of Jesus on the cross, we are redeemed. We have been set free. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who now dwells in us, our guide and comforter. We thank you that the Holy Spirit is at work and continues to conform us to the likeness of Christ. Help us by the power of the Holy Spirit to behold your beauty, to long for more of you and less of us. Help us to live to worship you, that our lives are centered around you as Lord, God and Father. Holy Spirit in us, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus' face. Let not the things of this world sway us. Thank you, Lord God, that we can call you Father. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that we can see and experience that love when we think of the cross, when we read your word. Continue to speak to us those things that you want us to know, to say, and to do. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.